Uh, and as, as Paul was saying, uh, I'll be talking a bit about injuries in uh, youth athletes today, mainly focusing on, on the male aspect and uh, on growth maturation as potential risk factors. And uh, I do not have any conflicts of interest to disclose. And by the time we're finished with this lecture, I do hope that maybe you have a slightly better understanding of how youth athletes uh, differ from adults and a better understanding of the literature in the, in the field of growth and maturation. Now, before starting, I think it's uh, a bit important to know who you're listening to. Uh, and as Paul said, I did complete uh, a master's degree in exercise physiology, so sort of coming from that side. Uh, but since 2017, I've been uh, here in Qatar with uh, ASPREV and the uh, Aspire Academy Sports Medicine Center. And I think when, whenever we're talking about injury prevention, I think, I think it is important to start with, with the end goal in mind. And when we're talking about elite youth athletes, uh, one of the main goals is to develop sports champions. So, so that's sort of the end goal we have in mind. And in order to reach that, we're looking for some sort of long-term development. Now, a threat to that is if a player gets injured, so he's not available and he can't develop in that way. So what we try to do is we try to prevent the injuries from happening. But in order to know what we're trying to prevent, we need to know something about which injuries occur and what the risk factors are so that, that we know what we're looking for. So we do these injury surveillance uh, uh, reports and uh, studies looking into risk factors. And you've all seen this figure, but it is quite a nice framework to work from, where we first try to see what the problem is, we try to see how and why injuries occur, what can we do about it, and see if that actually works in the end. And today we'll be focusing mainly on the first two aspects, so looking at the extent of the injury problem, and how and why they happen with growth and maturation in mind. So our two key questions for the day is, first of all, what's the extent of the injury problem? And we'll be focusing on football and athletics. And also if growth and maturation are risk factors for injury. Now, the reason we're talking about football and athletics today is, is convenient because that's what I've been involved with at Aspire. But they are also two major global sports and two big sports at Aspire. And the first... Uh, results we'll be presenting and discussing today is a study that was recently uh, accepted actually into BGSM and that is a collaboration with Aspire uh, Academy of Football Performance and Science Department and we're looking at injuries in, in the football group and the two main areas we wanted to look at was first of all what are the most common injuries and which injuries have the greatest impact on participation but we also wanted to look so if there Okay, um, they'll probably fix that up there. Okay. All right. <laughs> so we'll also be looking at uh, age group differences. So what happens if you're an under 18 player? Do you get different injuries than if you're an under 13 player, for example? So like I was saying, uh, the main focus of this study was to first look at uh, the most common and the most impactful uh, injuries and these age group differences, if, if any. So what we did in this study was we used four seasons of uh, training and injury data uh, from the Aspire Academy uh, football group. And we ended up looking at approximately uh, 600 uh, player seasons. So one player, one season is one player season. And they completed a total of almost 100,000 uh, training and match hours. Now, over this time, they experienced more than 1,100 time loss injuries. And we're talking about time loss injuries, so that's uh, an injury that restricted participation in the future uh, session. And if we, if we want to look at some of the key outcomes, um, it's nice to look at this at a, at a squad level. So if you're a coach, the guy in red here, uh, he can expect approximately 50 injuries and 1,000 days lost uh, over one season. And for any given session, four of his players will be restricted by injury for his session. Now, if you look at it from a player's perspective, a player can expect to uh, sustain around two injuries and lose around three weeks of training every season. But we want to look uh, a bit more into which injuries happen, not just the overall picture. 
And one way of looking at this is to, to count injuries uh, and divide it by the number of training hours. So how often do injuries occur? That's what we call the incidence. And when you look at this football group, it looks quite similar to adults, really, where muscle strains and spasms, contusions, and joint ligament sprains are the most common. But that only uh, really tells us one side of the story. And uh, we also need to know somewhat something about the severity, because the most common injuries may not be the most severe ones. And that's what you see here. When you look at the median day loss per injury, we see that fractures and bone stress are the most severe, but also that joint sprains are up there. And using these two pieces of information, we can calculate the injury burden, which is the number of days lost per 1,000 hours, and is a measure of impact. And when we look at this, we see that it is the joint sprains that are the most impactful or burdensome, followed by muscle strains and spasms, and bone stress and fractures. So these bone injuries are quite impactful, even though they are not so common. And we might also want to look a bit more into which uh, area these types of injuries occur. And again, if we look at the most common ones, we see that it is muscle injuries to the thigh, followed by ankle sprains, and epiphyseal injuries to the hip and groin. But again, that was only one part of the story. And when we look at those who have the most impact or the most burdensome injury types, based on location, that is the knee sprains. That's partly because of, for example, ACL injuries. They are so severe that even though they don't happen that often, they have a big impact on participation. And then again, thigh uh, muscle injuries and ankle sprains are quite burdensome because they happen often and they're associated with some uh, moderate day loss. So then the next question was, what happens with age? And when we look at, again, the incidence, so this is how often injuries occur. It's a fairly, it seems a very straightforward relationship, really, where the older you get, the more injuries you would, uh, would expect. But again, that's part of the picture. And when we look at severity, it's almost a bit of an opposite trend. But we see there is a bit of a spike in the under 16 age group. So when we look at the burden, we see that, that generally increases with age but it's the greatest in the under 16 age group. We can do this exercise for injury types as well. And what we can do is use this uh, risk matrix. And what we have here on the x-axis is the incidence, so how often they occur. And on the y-axis we see how severe they are. And the further up in the right corner you are on this graph, the more burdensome the injury is. And what we can see for this example, which is muscle injuries, is that we see that these are more common in the older age groups. Now, if we look at the growth-related injuries, so the apophysial injuries, we see that it's an opposite trend. So these are more common in the younger age groups. For joint sprains, maybe not so clear, but you still see that it, these are more common and also more burdensome in the three older age groups, with the greatest burden in the under-16 age group. For bone stress injuries, maybe again not so clear, we see a slight trend that these are more common with age and that they are the most burdensome in the under 16 age group again. So, so taking this information in, um, into account, we can answer our two questions from the start. We can say that the most common injuries were muscle strains and spasms, contusions and joint sprains. But when you look at those who have the most impact, it is the joint ligament sprains who are most uh, burdensome. And that also these bone type injuries are quite, have quite a large impact. And yes, there were age group differences. Overall, the injuries are more common uh, the older uh, the age group is. And the greatest burden is in the under 16 group. Muscle injuries are more common with age. While these uh, epiphyseal growth related injuries are less common with age. And the joint sprains and bone stress are the greatest in the oldest age groups, with the largest burden in the under 16 age group. So that, that was the football side of things. So, so we'll jump over to the athletic side. And this is data based on a study that was recently published in the BDSM, led by head physio at Aspire uh, Academy of Sports Medicine Center, Danny uh, Silvan. And again, we wanted to ask question like which injuries are the most common and which are the most burdensome 
But instead of looking at age groups, we wanted to look at the event groups. Because athletics is often grouped as one sport, but in reality, they're, they're very different when you look into detail. So if you look at the endurance athlete, a jumper, or a sprinter, or a thrower, they do very different things and compete in very different uh, ways, meaning that that probably will be reflected in the injury uh, patterns. And again, we used five seasons of injury surveillance data to answer these questions. And we looked at almost 400 athlete seasons from all these different event groups. Uh, we recorded around 70,000 training and competition sessions, which, we, uh, which is called athletic exposures, and almost 300 time loss injuries. So again, we're looking at time loss injuries. Now, since the squads are a bit different in athletics, uh, I'll present this data as, say, the academy program as a whole. If you are the academy athletics director, you will have around 78 athletes uh, per season on, on average over these seasons. And in that group, you can expect uh, around 60 injuries and, again, more than 1,000 days lost. And over one season, uh, 45 of these athletes will sustain at least one time loss injury. Now, if you look at it from the athlete's perspective again, an athlete can expect somewhat less than one injury uh, per season and losing two weeks of training. And if we do the same comparison we did with the football group, looking first at the most common injuries, we see again that muscle strains are the most common, but that bone stress and growth plate injuries are very common in this, uh, this group of athletes. Again, as, as expected based on what we saw earlier, this does not reflect the severity of injuries, where the stress fractures, acute fractures, and muscle strains are the most severe meaning that when you look at the burden or the, the impact of injuries, stress fractures are actually the most burdensome, followed by muscle strains uh, and bone stress injuries. Again, we can look at this by location as well. And we see that these thigh strains are the most common, but that lower leg bone stress is the second most common uh, injury, followed by ankle uh, sprains. And again, the most impactful thigh strains, but we also see that uh, stress fractures to the lumbar spine are uh, cause, of, cause of significant day loss, and again the lower leg bone stress uh, seems to be uh, a big impact here. So what then about these uh, event groups? And we can again use this risk matrix we saw earlier where the x-axis shows the incidence of how common injuries are and the y-axis the severity, and the further up in the right corner you are, the more burdensome they are. So if we look at this endurance group here, we see that is bone stress injuries are the most burdensome. And you look also, you also see the stress fractures up in the top left corner, they're, they're quite severe. These can sort of be seen on the same continuum, so they're not completely different. But medial tibial stress syndrome, or MTSS, is the most burdensome single diagnosis. Now, if you look at the sprinters, there's, there's one type of injury that clearly stands out here, and that's the muscle strains, with hamstring strains being the most uh, burdensome. For jumpers, stress fractures, the most burdensome, and spondylolysis, the most burdensome diagnosis. Well, for throwers, they seem to struggle more with meniscus and cartilage injuries, and especially to the knee joint. So when we look at the, these three uh, or four risk matrices, matrices, we see that depending on the group of athletes you're looking at, you will expect different injuries. So to answer this question again, the most common injuries in the athletics group were muscle strains, bone stress, and growth plate injuries. And, but the most burdensome were these, uh, especially these stress fractures. And there were differences based on event group. So uh, depending on which group of athletes you're looking at, there are different injuries that cause the most day loss. So, so we, we have a better understanding now of the extent of the problem. We know which injuries occur and which types are, are the most, uh, cause the biggest problems. So we'll jump to how and why these occur and go to our second question, which is, uh, are growth and maturation risk factors uh, for injury in elite youth sports? And, and to start this, I think it's important to, to have a bit of an understanding of how youth athletes differ from adults. 
And one, one aspect of this is, is growth. So you hear a lot about growth. And when we talk about growth in terms of um, research especially, but also in practice, we're talking about an increase in size. So that can be either of the full body or just a specific body part. So if we have our athlete here, if we want to look at growth, we will measure body mass, uh, stature or height, uh, leg length, maybe some breadth, and then you can see the changes in these uh, measures. Now, the other aspect, maturation, is, is a bit more complex. It's not so straightforward and may be a bit complicated to understand. And it is defined as a process of becoming mature. So it's a process and a progress towards a mature state, which means that we are looking at something with a very specific endpoint. And that, that can be quite important when we're in the youth groups, because football players, for example, will be playing with other teammates and against other teams that may be of different, uh, different stages in that process. And say in athletics, you will be competing against athletes or with athletes and training with athletes uh, in different parts of this uh, process. And that's, that can be, for example, depicted using a skeletal x-ray here, where you see the process of becoming mature in a skeletal sense is going from a skeleton of more cartilage to more bone, which you see on the right side here. Now, if we take a closer look at growth, this is something that has been uh, looked at over a long time, first by this, this French count who measured his son every six months for 18 years, but later um, has been done in bigger samples, creating these growth standards or, or reference charts. So you can look at what, what is normal growth. And when you look at that curve, it, look, it looks somewhat like this. And you see there is something going on around the age of 10, 12, 14, and it is slightly different in boys and girls. And a lot of that can be seen if we look at the same data in a different way, so we look at the change in height per year. So we're looking at growth rate or growth velocity. And that same data then looks like this. And I think the first thing you can notice here is that this is not a linear process. So there are phases of faster growth in early childhood, for example, and around adolescent, and, and phases of slower growth. And as I mentioned, the second thing you see is this very uh, clear adolescent growth spurt. And this starts around 8 to 10 years in girls, 10 to 12 years in boys, and reaches the, the, the maximum growth velocity around 10, 12 years in girls, 13, 14 year in years in boys, which is called the peak height velocity, or PHV. And in this period, you can grow up to 10 centimeters uh, per year, which is quite a lot. Another aspect that's, that's good to know is that, in general, your legs grow before your trunk, and you gain height before you have the peak uh, in weight gain. And there are also individual differences. And now, this, this figure shows the average, very smooth, nice curve for boys and girls, but it could also represent two different athletes. And we see that athletes differ both in terms of timing, so when these, this takeoff and when the PHV or peak height velocity occurs, and also the intensity of that peak. So, Looking at maturation, uh, that, that is, like I said, it is complicated and it is a difficult one to, to sort of explain uh, in, in, a way, in a way that makes sense. And one, one figure I thought showed this quite well was, was this uh, figure by, published by Marco in 2011, where he looked at the sta different pubertal stages with different ages. And you can see that, in general, you go from a state of being immature to a state of mature, let's put it very simply. And it follows a shape that looks somewhat like this. And again, we can see that this process normally, or on average, isn't linear. It might be for some athletes, but in general, we say that this is not a linear process. And there is a large variation in when these things and these um, events happen. It happens a bit earlier in girls than in boys, but there is a large variation. There are also very, there are also differences within an individual. So in the same person, depending on which system, body system you're looking at, they can be at different stages of maturation. So if we, for example, look at the skeletal maturation, that might not reflect uh, 
the somatic maturation or the, the maturation in terms of height or the sexual maturation. So that's important to think about when we look at the indicators of maturity status later on. There are also differences between different body parts and in general we say that for example bones mature from the bottom to the top, put it very simply. If we plot two hypothetical different athletes here as well, we see that, that there is also some differences between individuals. And we often look at that in terms of maturity status, timing, and tempo. And when we talk about maturity status, uh, we want to ask, ask, answer the question, where are you at a, any given point? When we look at timing, we're trying to say something about at which age, for example, which different maturational events occur, so for example, PHV. And we look at tempo, we try to see how fast you're progress progressing through different maturational stages. I think once you look at this, it's very clear that at the same given age, two athletes will be at very, uh, can be at very different stages of maturation. And using again these skeletal x-rays from earlier, we can see that these, these are actually from two boys of the same age. This is uh, from uh, Amanda Johnson's article in the Aspidar journal, we see that it's a six-year difference in um, biological age or skeletal age, but they're the same, um, say, chronological age. So youth athletes, they, they go, they get older, they develop, and at the same time they go, from this, they go through this process of, of getting mature, and that may happen at different times. And on top of this you have a growth spurt. So it is quite a messy situation we have to deal with here. And this, this, the next question would then be, what, well, what are the implications for injuries? That's what we're here to discuss today. And one of the things that have been put forward uh, and suggested is that youth athletes uh, have certain structures that are more vulnerable when they're immature. One being the brain, so you might be more susceptible and, uh, to concussion, it might be more severe. But that also goes in terms of risk uh, behavior and, say, uh, willingness to return from, uh, from an injury early because you don't see the consequences that clearly. The cartilage has been suggested as a bit more vulnerable. But we do especially look at the bone, the skeletal system, and growth plates. So that could be, for example, in the lumbar spine, as we saw earlier, that was a, uh, an injury that caused a lot, quite a lot of uh, day loss in, uh, in our athletes. It could be fractures to the, to the actual growth plate. But most commonly we think about these growth related injuries such as uh, Severs disease or Oscar Slatter's disease. And we take a, look at, a closer look at these growth plates. This is a, this is a picture borrowed from uh, Brooks and Kahn's Clinical Sports Medicine. We see the growth plates in green. Now that's, those are the primary uh, areas of uh, longitude or length, growth in length. There are also secondary uh, centers of growth where a lot of these tendons are attached, and that's what we call the, the apophysis, or uh, uh, where, where the muscle tendon unit inserts to the bone, and that is considered especially weak, uh, a weak point in immature athletes. And we remember from earlier, we said that typically uh, athletes mat uh, mature from the bottom to the top, meaning that you'll see problems with these growth plates in somewhat a similar pattern. This also means that the same mechanisms, the same injury mechanisms, may lead to different injuries uh, depending on your maturity status. So a mechanism that would lead to, say, a tendinopathy in a mature athlete might lead to apophysitis in a younger athlete. And a, a, a large force coming at a certain point might tear your muscle in a mature athlete, but it might just tear off the whole attachment in, in a less mature athlete. Uh, the second point uh, when we're talking about injuries and uh, in, in immature athletes is this period of rapid growth which we talked about earlier. And one of the reasons this may be a problem is that when you grow in length there are some increased forces, uh, increased tensile forces or compression forces on these um, uh, insertion points. So your, your muscle and your tendon doesn't really adapt as fast um, as your bone is lengthening. And you also have a bit thicker growth plates during this period of rapid growth. 
Now, a second aspect is that when you uh, grow a lot in length in terms of your bones, the, the mineralization of the bone lags a bit behind, so it seems like you have a, a temporarily increased risk of fractures due to this uh, lag in mineralization. The third aspect is maybe a bit difficult to relate to injuries directly, but we remember that athletes during the growth spurt can, they can grow 10 centimeters a year and gain 10 kilos, which, which is a completely different reality to the athlete. And, and we have this phrase called adolescent awkwardness, which sort of explains very well what's happening, that, that athletes are really struggling to adjust to their new body, and that might have implications not only for performance, but for injuries. So, so before looking at the study we've done at Aspire, uh, I'll go through a bit of the literature that's been done here. And, and looking at this, uh, I've, I've picked out uh, studies that have looked at elite athletes, if you can call that in, in youth, but if they are high level academy or elite, and if they prospectively follow the athletes for at least one season. And we'll start with the, with the growth aspect. And looking at growth and injuries, you can, you can do this in two, mainly two ways. Where the first one is, is fairly straightforward, where you measure growth rate directly. So you would start with an anthropometric measure, say height or weight or, or leg length. You'll give it some time, you'll measure again, and you'll see what the change was. And you'll see if those who change more are more likely to get injured or will get more severe injuries, for example. And if we look at the studies who have, who have looked at this aspect, we can see that in the left column we see the, there are two football studies and an alpine skiing study, but they are mainly in boys. One looked at monthly growth rates and the two others looked at uh, change from the start to the end of the season. And they all seem to find some relationships indicating that growth is implicated uh, in injury, with injuries. And for example, this study uh, by Kemper from Holland indicated that athletes who were growing more than 0 0.6 centimeters per month or gained 0 0.3 per month in, in BMI were at increased risk of injury. Now the second point or way of looking at uh, growth and injuries is to estimate this period around peak height velocity or PHV. And again you start doing this by, by, by using some anthropometric measures and this is why this is so popular because it's so simple to do. You don't need much equipment and it doesn't take that much time. But it does involve uh, an estimation of, of the PHV or peak high velocity period. And, and the most common equation probably being the, the Meerwald equation, where you use the current age, uh, body mass, seated height, and height, and you end up with uh, a measure of how far away you are from peak height velocity. Now, knowing that, that's what they call a maturity offset. And knowing that, you can divide players into, say, pre-PHV, circa PHV, and post-PHV. Uh, another way of using it, which is becoming quite popular, especially, say, in the, in the Premier League, is using this Kamis Roach method. And here you also factor in the parent's height. But instead of predicting the PHV, uh, or years from PHV directly, you start with the endpoint. So you look at the, the adult height, the predicted uh, adult height. And, and using knowledge about when, uh, in terms of percentage, that PHV occurs, which is around 91, 92%, you can again classify athletes based on their PHV status. Like, are they before, are they uh, going through their PHV, or are they, have they gone through it already? And again, you can look at this in terms of injuries. So if we look at some of the, the studies that have been done using this approach, we see again in the left column, all boys. When you're talking about elite athletes, this is. They use these anthropometric equations so three with Meerwald, one with Camus Roach, we see that they divide, they, d they uh, define the PHV period somewhat differently. I see that most of them find an association indicating that around PHV it seems to be more injuries or a greater burden. Now one, one example of this is uh, a Dutch study by Bolt and colleagues, where they divided athletes based on uh, where they were in relation to PHV. So in this case, they used th uh, three-month periods, 
and PHV would be uh, here uh, on this graph. And we can see that in the six months following PHV, there was a greater incidence, which is a left figure, and also a greater burden, which is on the right figure, when you compare it to the overall incidence and burden. You also see that it seemed to be decreased uh, before PHV. So if we, if we try to quickly summarize the, the growth side of things in terms of the literature that's out there, we see that higher growth rates probably imply a greater injury risk. And you may be more vulnerable around or right after your peak height velocity. But the studies are, are quite, say, weak in terms of design. The, the, like you saw, they're, they're mainly boys. They, they don't cover the full growth process. So you, can't, you can't necessarily say that uh, an athlete uh, was more injured when he grew the fastest because you don't know that. And these equations come with uh, limitations, especially when you look at it at, at individual uh, level. They also rarely consider confounding factors. So athletes get older. We saw earlier that if you get older as a football player, you get more injuries. So that's probably important to take into account. Uh, and the training hours, because if you train more, you're going to be at greater risk of injury. So you have to think about these things. And, and different in injury outcomes are also used, uh, making the, the comparisons very difficult. So if we look then at maturation and injury, yeah, and we said this is a complex thing. It's, it's really difficult to study and even di more difficult to understand what people have studied, really. But I'll I've tried to group it into two main approaches people use. The first one being how far along in the maturation process is the athlete. And, and you can do this by starting with an indicator of uh, maturity status. For example, skeletal maturation, which is considered probably the best indicator. Uh, but it does involve uh, taking an x-ray of your hand and wrist, which uh, it causes some ethical uh, concerns, at least. The de second approach would be to use somatic maturation. So we're talking about uh, maturation in terms of height, for example. And again, we can use these prediction equations, looking at the estimated or actual adult height, or, or this maturity offset, looking at how far or away are you from peak height velocity. But when we look at this, we don't re it's, it's complicated because we, we don't necessarily know if we're looking at growth or maturation, and it, it is somewhat overlapping. We can also look at uh, these secondary sex characteristics, for example, using pubertal stages. And when you have that indicator of maturity status, you can, you can, look, uh, you can try to answer the question if you're more vulnerable to injuries uh, when you're immature or when you're mature. And, and looking at studies that I felt fit into this category, you, you might not agree, uh, but you see again there are a lot of studies mainly including boys, and there are different sports involved. And you see that the, in the second column here there are so many different ways of looking at this, so maybe you can consider the, the years from PHV, you can consider some uh, sexual characteristics, or uh, percentage of adult height. You see that the results probably reflect this uh, diversity, where it's not so clear if there's a, there is a, a relationship to injuries. And one example is from the Spanish study, where they actually followed boys until their uh, height at 18 years, and they plotted their injuries in terms of their percentage of, of adult heights. And what we can see here on the three top yellow um, boxes is that muscle injuries and, and joint ligament injuries seem to cluster up towards the, the higher end, so closer to somatic maturity, while the growth-related injuries are more spread out, with the medium being at a, at a quite a lot lower point uh, in, in the maturity, uh, maturity process. If you look below this bottom uh, yellow box, you also see some of these specific diagnoses. And you can see a very clear pattern, although there is a big overlap, I have to say that, that these occur in this uh, distal to proximal pattern, as we mentioned before. So Severs disease happens at a younger percentage of adult height, compared to, for example, apophysitis of, uh, in the hip. So that, that was one way of looking at this. And another way of looking at it is, is, is probably the most common way of, uh, of addressing maturity status, 
which is classifying athletes based on if they're early, normal, or late maturing. And again, we need, we need to start with a measure of maturity. So say you pick skeletal age, age at PHV, or a pubertal stage, somewhere, something like that. But then you have to relate that to something. And that could be, for example, to your age. See if your skeletal age is in advance or delayed of your uh, chronological age. You can use a comparative study sample or a reference sample. And you classify then athletes based on if they're early, normal or on time, or, or late uh, in that regards. But, but this is a bit complicated again, because you can be early maturing and being immature. You can early be early maturing and being <laughs> very far along in this process. So, so it's not as easy as it maybe seems. And again, this is only to prove a point, it's not uh, to, to overwhelm you, but on the left side here we see a large uh, variation in the sports that have been looked at. And again, mostly studies in boys, not so many including girls. And in the second column, we see all these different maturity indicators that have been used to classify athletes and different approaches to classify our, uh, athletes as early, normal, or late, which again then reflects the, the, the quite different outcomes and inconsistent findings uh, on the right column, where it's not so easy to see, see what's actually going on if early or late maturing athletes uh, are at more risk. Maybe it's just dependent on injury types, for example. And, and this, is, this, is, this can be seen in the data that was provided by this French study uh, using skeletal age. We see that there was no overall, no significant difference in overall injury risk. But when you go down on the injury types, so the level of injury types, we see that there was a difference in tendinopathy, so that was more common in early and normal maturing athletes. Uh, osteochondral injuries and more of these cross-related injuries were more common in late and normal maturing athletes. Well, growing strains were more common in the uh, uh, early maturing athletes. And, and what I like about this study is that this is only players in one age group, so under 14 players. So, so we don't need to think about age as a confounding variable here. So again, to, to answer, is maturation associated with injury? I can only say that that is very unclear. It's very difficult to know if, if being later or earlier maturing is a risk factor. And may not seem to be so relevant for the overall risk, but it seems to be some differences when you look at the different injury types. And again, the study designs aren't great. Like again, we saw mainly boys. They don't follow a full maturation process in most cases. And, and there's so many different indicators of maturation that have been used. And few of them take confounding factors into account. And again, the, the inconsistency in terms of outcome uh, and detail in the outcomes makes comparison very different, uh, difficult. And this, this reflects the findings that, uh, that was presented by a systematic review. Now, now this review was on a more broader, um, this wasn't just uh, limited to elite athletes, and, and they used quite uh, broad outcome measures. But they also did not find any clear associations. And they actually suggested that clinicians should therefore avoid supposing uh, this, this causal relationship uh, because the findings are in inconsistent and, and at high risk of bias. So, so knowing this, we, we try to improve, uh, of course, <laughs> and we try to use growth and maturation uh, measures in, in the athletics groups and relate that to injuries. Again, we used the athletics program four seasons this time, but this time we only used the non-specialized athletes. So we remember that uh, event groups uh, had quite a, a big impact on the injuries you saw. So, so we decided to, to, to factor that out, use only those who aren't specialized, who so are following this general program. And that also me meant that most of the or, or those boys who were mature had already specialized, so, so there was more changes going on in this group as well. So we, we included 117 athlete seasons from 74 athletes, around 20,000 training and competition sessions, and 87 time loss injuries. We, we used the anthropometric measures from the start and the end of the season, and the skeletal age, which was taken at the start of the year, or the academic year, so start of the season. Now the three, three outcomes, or three 
exposures actually we were looking at were first of all growth rate so if you change more do you get more injured the second was maturity status and in this case we used the absolute skeletal age so if you had an older or a younger skeletal age at the start of the season the final one we looked at is was this concept of maturity tempo now that, that hasn't really been studied in in, in sports that well because it's, it's not that easy to do and we decided to do this based on the change in skeletal age over one calendar year because you could see that there were quite large differences some athletes didn't change so much in their skeletal maturity or skeletal age while others changed quite a lot so we try to see is that related to injuries and when we look at growth rates we saw that a change in height it wasn't related to overall injury risk but it was it did a greater change implied more bone and growth plate injuries and the same with leg length but there, there also overall injury risk was incre uh, increased but there was no relationship with uh, increased weight, BMI, or trunk height. When we look at maturity status, so that's the skeletal age. We saw that uh, boys with a younger skeletal age at the start of the season had more growth plate injuries. And for maturity tempo, we saw that if you change more in skeletal age over a year, you seem to be more prone to getting a bone injury. So as we were saying, the risk factors we found were greater change in stature and leg length, being skeletally younger, and going through a larger change in skeletal age over a year. But this was only mo mainly at the level of bone and growth plate injuries. So, so we've, we've talked a bit about what the extent of the problem is and, and how and why. So, so to wrap it up, we'll, we'll try to have some thoughts on what we can do about it. Because if, if growth and maturation do have an impact on injury risk, we, we probably want to do something about it. And you can't really change growth and maturation, in, in a sense. Uh, if you're well-nourished and if you're healthy, that's, sort of, that's um, mainly something that, that's natural. You can't really affect it that much. So probably one important aspect is, is to educate and make people aware of these processes. So if, if we can educate our athletes, our coaches, parents, and medical staff, they might be able to, first of all, uh, contextualize their per performance and progression so you're not tempted to, to try to train more because you're not catching up with your, your peers or, um, or you're falling behind in any way. That might just be because you're going through some really big changes. And you can also, if you know more about these problems, you can, you can detect uh, pain and symptoms at an earlier stage before they develop into more serious problems. The second thing you can do, we, we, can, we can try to monitor the, these processes. We can try to monitor growth rates and, and try to figure out where our athletes are in terms of maturity status. Now, we have to be aware though that the prediction equations that are commonly used, they come with limitations and they're not so good at an individual level. So you have to be very careful with the with the decisions you make based on those if, if you're even using them and when we're looking at growth rates for example we remember that Dutch study saying that if you grow more than 0 0.6 centimeters a month now that seems like a very nice cutoff to use but if if we know from the the, the work that's done at, by the football performance and science department the minimal change you can detect over a month is is around one centimeter so there's a lot of noise there so you might just be looking at a measurement error or biological variation so you have to be very careful when you uh, when you interpret your your results and if you want to look more at this I, su I, I do suggest looking at these articles on the right side now, now once you've monitored you you, you want to use it for something we can't just monitor for the for the fun of it and th there isn't really that much great research out on this uh, but there are a few articles I've, I've uh, included here on the right side if you want to have a closer look at it but it does seem that <laughs> pretty we say common sense training principles apply so variation in your training variation in your loading uh, safe progression and, and ensuring sufficient recovery between sessions that ha that has to be founded by by solid nutrition and sleep as well because because athletes who, who grow fast need uh, <laughs> need those things in place for that to, to happen uh, in, in the best way
And we can also try, if we want to, we can also try to group our athletes or, or base our training programs on this, uh, on, say, people who, or athletes who are going through the growth spurt. People are more or less mature. But, but again, I'll, I'll refer to these, these articles on the right side if you want to read more about this. So, so to wrap up, I think the key take-home message is that injuries, they do have a large impact on participation. Uh, and they are specific to age group in football and they're specific to event group in athletics. It's somewhat difficult to answer the question if growth and maturation are risk factors, but athletes do appear a bit more vulnerable during and following the growth spurt, and maturation likely affects the type of injuries that are sustained. And if we want to do something about it, we, we can educate and monitor, we can address pain and symptoms at an early stage, and we can consider making some adaptions to our training programs and training groups based on what we find. And finally, I just want to thank everyone who's been involved in, in these studies and, and pretty much all my time at Aspetar, friends uh, as well, uh, especially the Aspetar Sports Injury and Illness Prevention Program, uh, Aspire Academy Sports Medicine Center, who have welcomed me since day one, uh, the Aspire Academy Football Performance and Science Department, which we've had a really good collaboration with the last year and a half, and also the sports science department with these athletic studies. So thank you very much.